Hi right, guys, we'll see if the second time is a charm here after the collapse of my computer battery. I'm going to try another computer here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. So it is a cold winter night in early October. That would be Friday night, October 7th, 2022. So uh, now tonight, the little dog has a belly ache. He's not falling out of trucks. He's getting a bellyache, so we have him wrapped up on this cold winter night as we dive into our ecological meltdown roundup rant. We all know what that means being Friday, <coughs> October 7th. Yeah, October 7th, 2022. We're going to head over to Manga Bay, check in with Rhett Butler and the boys and girls for their weekly cavalcade of catastrophe unfolding on our collapsing planet. And uh, let's see, there's a lot in here. I'm, if I get to half of them, I'll be surprised. We're going to start out in Indonesia, as we often do here. As Indonesia paints rosy picture for orangutans, scientists ask, where is the data? Foreign scientists who were apparently banned, apparently banned, I guess, meaning, does that mean kicked out of the country? Foreign scientists who were apparently banned for questioning the Indonesian government's claim that orangutans are widely increasing in number insist none of the data supports that claim. <coughs> the five scientists were blocked were blocked from carrying out conservation-related research in the country after writing an op-ed that the forestry ministry deemed had negative indications that could discredit the government. Yes, said one of the scientists, quote, if the government says that orangutan populations are growing, I assume they have the data that none of us have access to, told Manga Bay. And then, of course, the ministry did not respond to requests for comment. The banning of the five is the latest in a string of actions by the current government that local and foreign academics have slammed as repressing science. Do you think so? Oh, then we have another article here about should, you know, national parks and game or all of that be human exclusion zones. I think we all know my take on that. Uh, moving ahead. Uh, good Lord, guys, there's a lot here. Uh, all right, let's get back to good old Amazon deforestation, which, uh, of course, is the bedrock of Manga Bay. Cutting down the Amazon does not build prosperity for most Brazilians. Deforestation proponents in Brazil routinely argue that cutting down the Amazon rainforest is an effective way to alleviate poverty. I'm not sure they've ever been to the slums of Manaus, Brazil, anyone claiming that. <clears throat> this is especially the case with the Bozo Miro administration, which issued an official statement to the 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference by stating that, quote, where there is a lot of forest, there is also a lot of poverty, close quote. So ahead of Brazil's latest election, a group of us led by Darren Norris of the Federal University of Ampa decided to see what the data say about links between deforestation and poverty in the Amazon. And uh, boil this down, we found no association between forest loss 
and the economic indicators, you know, that they're, uh, you know, deforestation proponents always yakking about. Uh, <clears throat> indeed, the economic indicators for municipalities with less than 40% forest cover were no different than those of similar municipalities with more than 60% forest cover, blah, blah, blah. These findings thus suggest that, quote, deforestation does not necessarily generate transformative and equitable food production systems, yes, or lead to poverty alleviation. Speaking of poverty, what is the story of the week from Haiti? Looking at Haitian mangrove forests, yes. Uh, <laughs> Haitian mangrove forests, I am shocked there's still any mangroves left in that hell hole. <clears throat> mangrove restorers in Haiti bet on resilience amid rising violence Haiti is one of the most deforested countries on the planet today, with its mangroves in particular now dotting just 30% of its coastline, much of it in thin, fragmented pockets. The main threat to the mangroves is the cutting of the trees to produce charcoal, an important fuel for cooking in a country where only a quarter of the population has access to <coughs> electricity. Several mangrove restoration projects have been initiated over the years, but many abandoned due to waning community interest, natural disasters, or poor planning. More recently, rising rates of violence have prevented restoration teams from going to the field and coordinating with one another. But some are still huh. Some are still huh. Some are still huh. hopeful that communities will remain receptive to mangrove restoration. Yes, despite all the other hardships they're experiencing. Okay, you're starving to death. You're getting ready to get robbed, raped, murdered. Uh, you're, you're living in an absolute hellhole. Your life is hanging by a thread and you are going to be receptive to mangrove restoration. Let me tell you where mangrove restoration plays on the list of things that Haitians are worried about. You can kiss Haiti's mangroves goodbye. Okay. You know, Manga Bay has its uh, own YouTube channel. And this week's video is titled, Why Do Scientists Say Earth's Water Cycle is Nearing the Breaking Point? Well, I know what they're saying under their breath, although I, I, I haven't listened to it. You can bet nowhere mentioned in here the reason why Earth's water cycle is nearing the breaking point is that there's eight billion, eight billion humans, you know, sticking straws in the Earth's water cycle. Maybe that has something to do with it, although I doubt, doubt you'll ever hear it, but who knows, maybe, uh, maybe Rhett Butler is actually going to talk about overpopulation in that story. Do not hold your breath. You will not believe this from the Democratic, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Locals in the dark about oil auctions in DRC. Huh. Greenpeace Africa and a group of environmental organizations have released a report 
in one of the first field investigations into local views on a wave of anticipated oil exploration. <clears throat> Researchers visited 14 villages in four of the proposed oil blocks, finding that most residents did not know hmm, about the government's plans. Yes. Meanwhile, this week, the DRC's environment minister rejected an appeal by U.S. Climate Envoy John Kerry to remove some blocks from the auction. Yes, John Kerry telling the Democratic Republic of Congo what to do with their oil auctions. There you go. Thanks for that sick laugh. Here we go. All right, guys. Finally, finally, we have solved Indonesia's plastic problem. I want you to go on and anywhere on YouTube and put in Indonesian ocean plastic where pretty much the entire country, at least, you know, every beach in Indonesia is under about eight feet of garbage. Uh, but don't worry, Indonesia is taking it seriously as Indonesian program pays fishermen to collect plastic trash at sea. The Indonesian Fisheries Ministry has launched a four-week program, a four-week program to pay fishermen to collect plastic trash from the sea. Of course, it's the Indonesian fishermen as much as anybody who are throwing the plastic garbage into the ocean. So if the Indonesian fishermen would just stop throwing their own goddamn garbage into the ocean, they would, you see what I'm saying? If, if they just wouldn't throw it into the ocean, they would, they could sell it back. I, anyway, I don't know if they talk about this in the article or not. That is Indonesian fishermen. I, anyway, I think we get it. All right. <clears throat> A four-week program. The initiative is part of wider efforts to reduce Indonesia's marine plastic pollution by 70% by 2025. Uh-huh, yes. The country is a top contributor to the plastic trash crisis in the ocean. But don't worry. And by 2025, that means by the end of 2024, so do the math, 70% of Indonesia's plastic trash will disappear. Each of the 1,700 participating fishermen will receive the equivalent of $10 a week for collecting up to 9 pounds of plastic waste from the sea daily. There you go. Uh, I, would, I, I wish there was some way to see what this program is going to contribute towards eliminating 70% of the plastic trash. My guess, it will have a lot smaller effect than, uh, well, about the same effect as banning plastic straws. Uh, is there anybody on this planet and I don't mean just people listening. Is there, is there one person on this planet believing this unadulterated, greenwashing horseshit for one second? This, this, this is absolute crap. Rhett Butler knows goddamn well every word of this story is a sick, twisted joke. He knows damn well. Anyway, you go. Indonesia, say Indonesia saving the planet. All right, but we got to move on. There's a lot here. <clears throat> Sulawesi, I don't even know where that is. Is that in Indonesia? 
Sulawesi Islanders grieve land lost to nickel mine. Yes, the Harita Group holds a nickel mining concession covering about 2,500 acres on Wanoni Island. Yes, the arrival of the mine has divided the community between those who support the development and farmers hoping to retain their fruit and nut trees. One man described his grief as the grave of his son was exhumed and moved as, as a result of the mine. Yes. Okay. Well, just as they predicted last week, uh, down there in the elections in Brazil, you know, so it's gone off, the presidential thing going off to a runoff, but, as, they, as we were predicting last week, conservatives tighten their grip on Brazil Congress hampering environmental agendas. Brazilians elected a more conservative Congress in the October 2nd ballot with supporters of President Jair Bozonero and the agribusiness lobby winning seats in both the lower and upper houses. Yes. Uh, so, you know, wh wh what this is saying, that even if Lula is elected, you know, that Save the Planet, Lula is elected, you know, his hands are completely tied, but uh, I think we've beaten that dead horse. Okay. What is going on with the terrestrial insects of Brazil? Take a wild guess. We have trouble in the tropics as insects are in decline. New research from Brazil shows terrestrial insects there are declining both in abundance and diversity, while aquatic insects are largely staying steady. I don't know if mosquitoes, I mean, half the time they're... Anyway, I honestly don't know if they consider mosquitoes aquatic or terrestrial insects. Given a dearth of long-term data on tropical insects, the scientists took creative means to collect data. I bet. Uh, scientists believe the usual global suspects are behind Brazil's insect decline. Habitat destruction, pesticide use, and climate change. Do you think so? Imagine that. Okay. A lot of news out of Sub-Saharan Africa this week. Here is Disclose the Deal East African Pipeline opponents say. Champions of a new crude oil pipeline set to run about a thousand miles from oil fields in Uganda to a port in Tanzania say it will transform East Africa's energy landscape, propelling Uganda into middle income status among other claims under uh, other uh, completely unadulterated horseshit claims propelling Uganda into middle-income status while the oil is going into Tanzania. My guess is it's being sold to China. I'm assuming this is part of the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. Critics of the pipeline call it a mistake in a world where the impacts of the climate crisis are being increasingly felt and stopping the pipeline has become a rallying cry for campaigners around the world. Yes. I love this. Key agreements that would reveal critical info about the agreements between the oil company and the countries, you know, with pipeline going through it, remain hidden from the public despite despite 
Uganda being a member of the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. Yes, Uganda being a member of the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, somewhat akin to Sancho Panza being a member of the Chipmunk Protection Society. Yes. Alright, so uh, Manga Bay is starting a new bi-weekly roundup of stories from Africa called Forest and Finance. Yes, looking at Africa's forest. Okay. Uh, cook stoves and woodlots are the first step in a plan to halt deforestation in southern Zimbabwe. There you go. And how about a reforestation initiative experiments with providing Zimbabwean forest farmers seeds from indigenous trees rather than seedlings. Yes. Uh, okay. Alright. How about, can you stand one more thing about plastics? One more thing about plastics. They could be acidifying the ocean study says. New research suggests that plastic could contribute to ocean acidification, especially in highly polluted coastal areas through the release of organic chemical compounds and carbon dioxide. Yes, the study found that sunlight enabled this process and that older degraded plastics released a higher amount of dissolved organic carbon and did more to lower the pH of salt water. All right, we have a new study identifying mature forest on U.S. federal lands ripe for protection. All right. Uh, so according to this new big study, an altogether older forest, now this is not saying old growth, okay? There is a big difference between older and old growth. This is like old second growth, or probably old third growth, kind of like what I have here at Bugs in a Jar Farm is getting old enough now. The tree, this Bugs in a Jar Farm was wiped out probably a hundred years ago, but now the trees all over upstate New York and New England are, are turning back in to older forest. And so they're saying we now have 167 million acres or 36% of all forests in the contiguous 48 states, about a third of this, or roughly 58 million acres, are on federal lands. Yes. And just 24% of the Forest Service and BLM forests are now fully protected. Uh, offering the Biden administration an opportunity to more thoroughly protect far more old growth and mature forest on federal lands. Uh, now according to this, uh, I have a big problem with this statistic being from Atlanta, Georgia. The new study identified a challenge inherent the majority of federal lands are in the West, but one of the highest concentrations of U.S. mature and old growth, now here they are saying old growth forest, is in the Southeast, where most older forests are on private property. So it's going to be tougher 
uh, you know, be tougher to protect them because they're all turning into wood chips and being sold to Europe. Uh, all right. Okay, here's a question. Will the Uinta Basin Railway derail U.S. climate change ref efforts? Well, I'm going to sound like book hermit here. I, it will, it's one more ingredient in the toxic stew. The Uinta Basin, which I think is in Utah, is home to a diverse set of creatures from endangered black-footed ferrets to plants that cannot be found anywhere else in the world. But the basin also sits atop pockets of crude oil and natural gas, which are being extracted to transport these fossil fuels to the Gulf Coast. Yes, as local governments and oil companies are planning to invest up to four and a half billion dollars to construct a new railway through it. Uh, there you go. The project has been approved, but construction has not begun yet. Uh, so, uh, all right, we have more. Uh, oh, this is another uh, bi-weekly African roundup. This is called Element Africa. Yes. Okay, we're all we can expect all kinds of new stories out of out of Africa. So the first edition, I guess, Element Africa, Diamonds, Oil, Coltan, and More Diamonds. Offshore, offshore diamond prospecting threatens a fishing community in South Africa. Offshore diamond, ne never heard of it, while unchecked mining for the precious stones on land is silting up rivers in Zimbabwe. In Nigeria, cereal polluter Shell is accused of not cleaning up a spill from a pipeline two months ago. Yes, do you like the African Roundup? What do you think? What do you think about the cereal polluter Shell not cleaning up a spill? Also in Nigeria, mining for coltan Important metals in electron, uh, important metal in in electronics applications continue to destroy farms and nature, even as the Nigerian government acknowledges it is being done illegally. Yep. Okay, as long as we're over there. Let's look at some big mining leak over there. In July of 2021, an Angolan diamond mine leaked large amounts of polluted water into the Kasai River Basin, which stretches across Angola and the DRC. Twelve people were killed. A further 4,400 fell ill, and an estimated 1 million more were affected by the polluted water. 14 months later, the DRC government still has not released full results of the tests conducted on the river. Yes, but a ban on drinking the water from the rivers remains in place. An independent report published last month found that the leak killed off much of the river's aquatic life with severe and ongoing impacts on river-dependent communities. Apparently, the cat is all excited about the African Roundup. What do you think about the news from Sub-Saharan Africa? So, do you think the world is not paying attention to the news from Sub-Saharan Africa? That got a big yawn. 
Alright. Okay, here we go. I, when was it? Was it last week that I was uh, blowing the whistle, uh, the bullshit, hitting the bullshit detected button on, on some crap claiming that only 17% of the Amazon rainforest has been degraded or destroyed and you know all of these people saying when it hits 20 percent it's going to you can kiss it goodbye and that we're at 17 percent 17 percent my ass and uh so now we hear this one the amazon will reach tipping point if current trends of deforestation continues a report by the Amazon network of geo-referenced social environmental information claims that 26%, not 17%, 26% of Amazon forests have transformed irreversibly and show high levels of degradation the savannization of the Amazon is already visible in Brazil and Bolivia, while Ecuador, Colombia, and Peru seem to be heading in the same direction. So 26%, a little bit better. I still, uh, I, 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 I'm not going to hit the bullshit detector button quite as heavy. Uh, anyway, 20 minutes, from this point on, you know, kiss it goodbye. Uh, you know, sometimes, guys, you have to, all you can do is laugh. <clears throat> How Sri Lanka's forced organic transition crippled its tea industry in April of 2021. Uh, you know, the guy who was then the president abruptly banned imports of chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides in an attempt to preserve Sri Lanka's fast depleting foreign currency reserves. The government sold the plan as a shift to organic agriculture. That would make Sri Lanka the world's first toxin-free nation, but in the process disregarded warnings by academics and agronomists about the disastrous economic fallout. Several months after the aggressive shift, Sri Lanka's agricultural output has plummeted by 20 percent while farmers who account for 27% of the country's workforce have been driven into acute poverty and desperation. And this, uh, you know, guys, I can't help but get a sick, twisted laugh. Uh, my guess is a lot more, they plummet a lot bigger than any 20%. And if they keep it up, it's going to completely crash. Anybody thinking for one minute that organic farming is going to save the planet, is going to save a planet of 8 billion people. This planet, organic farming, supported a population of about 1 billion people. Uh, what was some article and interview I was just having recently with, uh, with Robert Jensen? You know, if, if we stopped chemical fertilizer, if we yanked fossil fuels uh, out of fertilizer, approximately one half of this planet would starve to death the first growing season. We would have a population reduction of uh, from 8 billion to about 4 billion in the first growing season. You know, that hilarious thing I was talking about, about just stop oil. Just stop oil. Well, you know, oil, gas, and coal, you know, just stop fossil fuels. You stop fossil fuels, the, of course, the global industrial economy would collapse. 
probably in the first week, one half of the population of this planet would starve to death uh, in a few months if we stop fossil fuels. Okay, here's this uh, long article which I can't get into, it's, but it uh, could be its own rant. Putting a price on water can commodification resolve a world water crisis? No commodification would only exacerbate a world water crisis. Anybody who thinks putting a price on water is going to resolve a, a world water crisis? Uh, but you can look for it. Uh, you will I guarantee you uh, that you're going to see water markets forming all over this planet. Critics fear that creating a water market is a first step toward a future in which just a few corporations will be able to charge market rents for what should be a free natural resources. Huge questions remain over water allocations for industry, agribusiness, and smallholders, cities, and traditional indigenous peoples. Uh, there you go. You heard it here. Uh, Okay, uh, good Lord, guys, uh, all right, we're going to end up, I mean, there's a lot here, but uh, I realize I'm talking to myself, so we are going to end up with a noble savage story. I, uh... I have to do one noble savage story at least each week. <clears throat> Amazon reserve for uncontacted people. Yes, uncontacted people moving forward amid battle over oil fields. Hmm. Isolated and recently contacted noble savages in the Peruvian Amazon. And remember, I, I have spent uh, four months of my life living with the noble savages in the Peruvian Amazon. This is when I disabused myself of the myth of the noble savages, when I actually went down there and spent some time with the guys. Okay? They are humans. They want the same thing that any human wants. Anyway, isolated and recently contacted noble savages in the Peruvian Amazon have had their existence officially recognized. They've had their existence officially recognized. Yes, and are one step closer to being protected through the creation of the Napo Tigro Indigenous Reserve. The reserve would prevent outsiders and extractive industries, including logging and oil companies, from entering their territory. This will prevent the spread of diseases and deforestation in the region. But we have a problem. A petroleum company called Pirenko and a group of businessmen and government officials oppose the creation of the Noble Savage Reserve. According to the group, the reserve will be an obstacle. The reserve will be an obstacle to ongoing and future development in the oil-rich region. And to make matters worse, some Noble Savage leaders are also against the creation of the isolated indigenous reserve. The noble savage leaders and their noble savage communities receive 
infrastructure projects, transportation, health services, and employment from Pirico. Imagine that, uh, y y y you know, you have a choice living like a savage out in the out in the jungle or or taking advantage of infrastructure projects transportation health services and jobs from an oil company if you are a noble savage leader what are you going to do you're going to take the moolah you're going to take the roads this uh, all of this stuff that these oil companies go down there and promise and they deliver probably about 10% of what they promise lie out their ass on the other 90% but uh, you, you know uh, I, I, I can imagine if the state of New York was going to tell me okay since uh, okay since you're such a doomer uh, we're not going to let you drive we're not going to let you you know build a house uh, be able to go to the store, uh, whatever, so you can live like a noble savage out in the woods. I would tell them they're damn crazy. They're people. And they're going to do what any human would do. Anyway, enough noble savage ranting, because I realize I am ranting to myself, and this camera might have cut off 20 minutes ago for all I know. So I'm going to wrap it up and uh, go find some Pepto-Bismol for my little uh, stomach-ached dog. Get out there and uh, contact a noble savage while you still can. My guys. Yes, yeah, little dog, do you need some Pepto-Bismol or what? Bubba might have some Pepto-Bismol right up. Bye, guys.